All right, welcome. So we are nearing the part where you guys get to work on your own projects. Woohoo! So that's actually fun, fun, fun stuff. And remember, your whole project, so your whole like class so far has been to get to the point where you can have a keyboard access, you can add, you can put things on the screen. You are going to learn today about how to deal with some issues that um, about uh, what happens when two things want to do things at the same time, what happens. And so you're getting to the point where after this week and next week, you will be all set to like launch yourselves into a new cool project of your own devising. And you should start to think of uh, teams for your project. You can have teams of up from between one to three. Um, two is ideal. All right, teams of one is just you, and yeah, sure, you can do it, but it's not as, you know, working in team, teamwork, et cetera. I mean, you can do it if you have a really, like, crazy project that you want to do and nobody else really wants to do it. That's fine. Three is you're, we're going to expect more work from you. So if you have a team of three and you go do a project that's just as good as a team of two, guess what? The team of two gets a better grade, right, because the team of three needs to do more work for that. So we need to be able to have that demonstrated, okay? I think team of one is kind of... You know, you it, it's it's not like you can do less work to be a team of one. If you're going to be a team of one, that's because you're like you're really super into like I'm going to do this on my own. Um, not ideal, <clears throat> as I said. But you should start thinking about that. The last two labs uh, of the quarter are going to be devoted to working on your project, right? So you're going to have to do a proposal, and then you're going to have to do a check-in and so forth. But that's your time to like another couple hours of your week to get to to, to get going on that. Um, last couple things we're going to have, you can have late days up to assignment seven. We can't do late days on the final project. We need those because we need to grade them and we all want to leave for summer too. So you uh, you can't uh, be late on those. All right. What questions do you have so far about that, Allie? Do you have a final presentation day? There is a final presentation day. Do we know when it is yet? The 12th. The 12th. Tuesday the 12th. Tuesday the 12th. All right. And and that's a fun day. Like we that That's really fun because you have to see everybody's cool projects and, and it's a lot of fun. What other questions? Okay. All right. A couple quick things. Um, this came up in uh, in office hours yesterday. Okay. The single and double buffering. Okay. First of all, what's the point of the single and double buffering? Why do we do, why do we want double buffering? Phil talked about this a little bit the other day. Like, why do we care about it? What do you think? Yeah. So you can swap quickly through quick transitions. So you can swap quickly. Remember, if you have one window that you're drawing into, right? If you're drawing into it. Well, you can first of all you can see the drawing happening because this thing is not that fast when it draws. It turns out if you're if you um, were running a real operating system and you you had the time to build a whole bunch of other things in there, it would probably get a lot faster. And in fact, Lenny's going to do a cool uh, lecture next week, next Friday, two weeks in two weeks. That's going to be all about how do you make this drawing actually much 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 faster, like hundreds of times faster, so it doesn't actually show up on the screen. But that's that's definitely a good a good point. So if, you, if you're doing the single buffer, you, you end up having to write things onto a screen that's already there. And it's like, why are you doing that? It's better to have this double buffer. And what's the, what, what do we have to do to have a double buffer? What do you guys remember what we have to do to have the double buffer in this case? Yeah. Uh, double the height. Yeah, so we're basically saying, okay, now we have our screen here. And each part... Like this is a whole screen's worth of information, and this is a whole screen's worth of information. And if this part is on the screen now, you're busy writing to this part, and the and the like person is looking at the top one. And then you want to show this one, so you flip them, and you actually do that with this what you what the the code that you're going to write for this assignment, where you say, okay, hey GPU, instead of pointing your buffer to here, you're now pointing the buffer to here, and the GPU goes, oh, okay, I'm going to draw all this on the screen at the same, and then now you can go up here and redraw all this. So you're constantly flipping back and forth between the screen that you're drawing on and the one that's actually being shown on the display itself. Okay, and the and Phil went over the reasons why we care about the like when we want to make it a uh, uh, we want we need to make it uh, vertical instead of horizontal because you couldn't do the math. The GPU wouldn't be able to do the math that way. In the what doesn't that because remember the GPU. Here's the other thing about the screen, right? I was talking to some people in in office hours yesterday about this. If we have a two dimensional screen, isn't the two dimensions completely abstract in the big picture? Like, there's no two-dimensional memory in your computer. There is one giant array that's just memory location 0 up to memory location uh, 32 to the 32 minus 1. 
Like that is one giant memory location. And so this this buffer for the G, the GPU in this direction, it's like this is address zero, then address four, we'll say, then address eight, etc. Let's say it goes over to address one thousand and twenty four. What's this address going to be? Let, let's make it one thousand and twenty. <laughs> What's this address down here going to be? One thousand twenty four. Etc. Because it's just stretching out the, it's basically just stretching out the memory like that. And this is one big thing. So you're abstractly figuring out how the two dimensions, because we want, we think in two dimensions, because the screen is actually in two dimensions. So it's nice to do that. And that's where you have to get into this, this um, interesting way of defining things like int parentheses star uh, frame buffer bracket. The uh, let's see. I guess it's not the width. I guess some people. Have been, I've seen some people do it with the width. That actually works in some cases, depending on how you do it. Uh, you can do the width or the pitch in there, and that's saying, give me a two-dimensional array that I can now access by saying frame buffer y bracket x, like that. Okay. So again, frame buffer zero zero would be this top left corner. Frame buffer one zero would be what? Yeah, it's like this location. It's one below in the y-axis in that case. Okay, and you have to be a little careful about using the pitch versus the width and so forth. Does that make sense? People a little more like clear on that? Yeah, you see. Sorry, if I did this, this would be one zero. Yeah, or if I did one one, it would be one pixel to the one x pixel over, one y pixel down in that case. Yeah, James. I'm All the way down. It continues all the way down, right? So this is going to be 2048. This is going to be 2048 plus 1024, etc. Because it's just it's the it's a two-dimensional math in this case. If you think about it, like every time you go over by a width, then you go down by one. You've added width amount to the next line. Width amount, width amount, width amount. So you're looking for when you exceed the end and you drop down to the You look, at, yeah, but you, right. You look at how when you're when you get to the, the end of the line. Now, by the way, you're going to have to think about this later when you do, when you're doing your console too about like how do you get characters at the end of the screen. To wrap around to the other side of the screen, you got to think about that too. The same sort of basic idea. Yeah. Um, what is the depth parameter that we use? The depth parameter is about how. What is it? The depth is. It's the bits per pixel. Bits so, per yeah, pixel. So we're right. Just doing we're just doing thirty-two. Color, but you can make your display sixteen bit color or twenty-four bit color. Yeah. If you made it, if you made it one bit color, it'd be black and white. Right. Each bit would be a different color, and you'd actually be able to save a lot of memory that way because you could fit eight pixels into one byte if you wanted to, right? So that would, that would be an, another option. But in this case, we're just going to do 32 because we're using a RGBA pixel. All right, other questions on this? <coughs> yeah. So when you, you know how you said like when you're declaring something, you can it. When you're declaring this, yep. Yeah. yeah, that's your, uh, you can create like an array that just like this one. Right, you can now, this is now a pointer to width size elements. So you can now actually point it to some location and then the compiler will take care of going, oh, I know where your breaks are for each X and Y for that Y location. And for where the Y originally came from, is it because like FB is a pointer? So FB is a pointer to a frame buffer. FB is, yeah, in this case, this is a point, basically this is a pointer to an array, which basically is the same as a double as a two-dimensional array. You can think of it that way. This is a pointer to an array of things of size width. Yeah, but the Y came from the F. Yeah, the Y, I mean the Y is just another, it's just the index into how far down you are in the, in the, in the, yeah, it's the height in this case, how far down you are. Okay, all right, more questions, bring those into office hours. All right, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about this font get char function. Anybody confused about that when they looked at it in lab the other day? <laughs> right? There were a couple like interesting things about that. Let me talk about that in, in a little more detail here. If you look at, let's see, where is it here? Do I have it here? Nope. Nope. There we go. Font.c. Okay, let's look at uh, let's look at font dot font dot h for a second. Oh, no, there's no font date. Sorry, font dot c. This have the yes, this does have it in there. So this, all of these bytes here are our way of saying 
we are cramming all those characters into as small a space as possible. Well, we could probably even do better, but in the, this case, we're at least doing it so that you understand. We're not using some like Huffman encoding or something to like to do this or whatever, right? But basically, we're saying this is a very compact way of doing this. And then if you look at the get font char function, is it get font get char? Font get char function. There it is. Okay, this whole thing here, if you stare at it long enough, you'll be able to figure it out. But let me give you the bottom line. Well, you had time to stare at it in lab, and, then I, and you, should, you should understand it. But here's the deal. This function gives you back an array of ones or zeros, although it's not one and zero. It's FF or zero, okay, for each pixel in a letter, okay? So it's going to give you back, uh, it's going to give you back enough bytes for the entire image. Now, how big was our image? Do you remember? 14, our each character is 14 by 16, and 14 by 16 is 224 bits long. So you're going to get an array back of 224 bytes. Each byte is either going to be 0 or 0xff, meaning that you should draw, not draw a pixel if it's 0, or you should draw a pixel if it's ff. Now, what does that mean? If it's 16, if it's 14 by 16, it goes like this. The first 14 pixels you get, the first 14 bytes are going to be the first line of code. The next 14 bytes are going to be the next line of code. The next 14 bytes are the next or next line of the character, etc. All the way down. And if we were drawing an A, maybe it would be no, nothing, 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 a little bit. Nothing, 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 nothing. Next line. Nothing, 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 a little bit there, nothing, a little bit there. Next line. And see how I'm kind of drawing an A here, and maybe this is going to be like that, and then. I'm not going to be very good at drawing A, but anyway, do you see how that kind of ends up as an A looking like that? I'm going to show you a little program that will do that on the screen for you, and that will hopefully um, hopefully clear things up a little bit more. Question? Would it be 14 times 2 bytes? No, each byte is either a 0 or a 1, and if it's a 0, you don't write a pixel in that location abstractly, and if it's a 1, you do. Okay. Let me show you a little program I wrote. Actually, let me just let me just run the program first. Okay, I'm going to run this program on the Pi, and let's see, I think I can do that and that, and I'm going to leave it in the. Here we go. Okay. Oops. Oh no. Maybe it's going to do it there. Uh oh. That is actually new. Hang on. It's not going to make me happy if we can't do any demonstrations on this today. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So if I go and type, how many people type on their keyboard and wonder why nothing's happening on their computer? You've done this like a thousand times. Yeah, I did that about 400 times before I finally figured it out to go to walk over my other keyboard here. Okay. If I type in A, watch what this program does. <coughs> a. It printed out. Does it look like an A? I hope a lowercase a. If I do uppercase X, it prints out the actual character for the uppercase X. Okay, if I do D, C, D, E, F, G, exclamation point, etc., it does that. Let me show you some of the code that does that using that uh, function. Okay, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna take. Oops, I'm going to not. That's this is debug mode. I'm gonna show you what it does in non-debug mode. But here's the whole code to do that. Watch this. I get the font size. This is my print letter code. I get the font size. I get the image into an image array that's how big? It's as big as the font size. And how big do we say the font? How many pixels are in the font? Each character of the font? 224. So this is going to be my buffer of 224 up here. And then I'm basically just going to walk through it. And if the image at that, if the pixel at that location, if the byte at that location is FF, I'm going to print an X, like a character X on the screen, not the bit, just one character X, right? If it is not a Let's make it a different character. What other character do you want to make it? A zero. Okay, sure. No, that's okay. well. Okay, we can do that if we want to. Um, but okay, fine. We'll make it a zero. But anyway, it's just going to it's going to um, print that out. In fact, I'll I'll go back up and show you that it's just going to print zeros instead of the sixes in this case. All right. Make install. And I have my little switch on here. Go. Okay, and there we go, and there we go. Okay, A is now made up of zeros, <laughs> right? That's all it is. Okay, so that's what that's all about. Um, 
And but have you guys ever seen a banner program that actually like you don't like doing A, B, C, D? What we'd rather have is what? Make, let me show you, install. And what we might want to have is something like this. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to type some characters like hello, exclamation point. And when I hit return, keyboard. wrong keyboard. <laughs> Oops, did I fail? No, I didn't fail. Okay. Hello, exclamation point. There we go. And that's it. Now, how did I do that? I had to walk through and figure out how to get one line at a time and put it into a buffer. You can see the code. It's going to be online. But the idea is you get back this character that has all the information there, and it's not, you don't have to do further, like, like digging into the individual, like, compressed bits. There's no more compression. We've uncompressed it already for you. If you wanted to make a fancier font and you wanted it to not just be black and white, but have, like, gray kind of around the edges? Yeah. Good question. First of all, we, 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 do we have the, we must have the code where we created the font. What we did was we printed out all the characters and then ran this program on it that actually scanned the characters and like looked for like dark and, and light. Um, as Phil mentioned this the other day in class that the, having the gray around is called anti-aliasing, which makes it look better on the screen, right? And in fact, you can sometimes zoom in and see that there's anti-aliasing here. Can you see like the, the X up here? See how it's like got like gray, like kind of, you know, it's, it's not perfectly black, et cetera, on each little line. It, it does do that because it's easier for humans to read that. Um, the reason we don't do that for the class is because that would make your pixels not be ones and zeros, but be, you'd have to have a much bigger file to keep track of the color. And then it would take a minute or so to load each program, and that's not very fun. But you could do that. And in fact, if you want to do that for the, an, an extension or you want to do that for your project, go right ahead. Phil, question? No, okay. All right, any other questions on this? You can go look at the code on that to see how that is done. All right. Now, let's get into this cool new topic. I don't know who came up with this, uh, this picture, but um, when you're using your computer, okay, your computer has the ability to do one instruction at a time. Right? And it does one instruction, and then it does the next instruction, and then it does the next instruction, and then it branches if you have a branch instruction. These are all the kinds of programs that we have used before. Okay? And the thing about it, though, is that sometimes that doesn't make it easy to do things that you want to that involve different things kind of happening at the same time. Okay? So let's take a look at a program where we're going to do the following. We're going to read a character from the keyboard, and then we're going to update the screen and print that character on the screen and update it. And then we're going to go and read another character, and we're going to update it, and we're going to read another character and update it, etc. Okay? Let me show you what that program looks like. All right, this is the one up here. Uh, nope. Yep, this is it right here. Okay, make, install, and this one All right, should... I do probably need the lights off for this one. Some of you mind turning the lights off. I'm going to connect the Raspberry Pi to the screen here. Our Raspberry Pi is connected. And um, I don't know, didn't really know why the little lightning bolt. Is that because the, the Pi is thinking that it, there's no program? Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Well, anyway. Okay, see so yeah, it says waiting up there. All right, if I go into the right keyboard and I type A, all right, it comes up with it. You see an A on the screen. And what it did was it basically read the character A and then updated the screen, printing the A and then making it red. And then I think it did a couple more like sweeps of, of changing the colors. Okay, and if I type B and C and D and E and F and G, or well, F and H, um, then it, uh, it does that. Okay, but I happen to have one program, I happen to have one keyboard contest before in like typing because I'm a fast typist. Not really, I was, it was against a uh, one of my employees when I was in the Navy, and she actually beat me, I think. <laughs> but anyway, I, I think like to think of myself as somewhat a fast typist, right? So if I type A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, notice what happened. It said H, right? And I assure you, I typed A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but I did it relatively fast. Why? Why did it do that? Why can't it figure out how to get the keyboard input while it's doing that? Who has an idea? Jacob. Because as it's when it gets a character, it draws on the screen, and while it's drawing on the screen, it's no longer waiting for the keyboard input. Yeah, when it's drawing on the screen, is everybody else going to say the same thing? When it's drawing on the screen, is it waiting for that low 
uh, that that um, uh, falling edge? Is it waiting for the falling edge, or is it like spending all its time, boom, drawing on the screen, and that falling edge just kind of goes away, right? Yeah. So let's see if we go back to the screen here. Then the issue is that this is what we want. Okay. Basically, it takes a whole bunch of time in the blue to update the screen. We've got this time where we're waiting for the character press, right? And then the character press happens, and then it goes and updates the screen. But the problem is that, as you said, we've got a keyboard scan code that's coming fairly fast, right? 11 kilohertz, and there's 11 bits per scan code, meaning you get a lot. Not only that, it's like while you're drawing the screen, at any time while you're drawing the screen, if you're not watching for that, if you're not waiting explicitly for that falling clock edge, you're going to miss it. And in fact, if we did it enough times, you'd probably see random crazy characters coming out there because it would probably, well, it might not even be that. If our keyboard, if our, if our scan code reader is robust enough, it will just ignore keys that don't, that happen kind of in the, in the borderline there. But that's the big, the big issue that you're not doing it, like you're doing it too slow, right? So here's what's really happened, right? We're getting the character, it's in the middle of update screen, we lose the character. Okay, let's look at that code for a second. Uh, let's see, it is main.c. Okay, so here's the read char char the character from keyboard, right? I'm just basically uh, reading that in and putting it into a global line buffer here. Okay, and then update screen. Okay, so I did a more more I did a little bit more than I said. I changed the screen to black, then to blue, then to white, then to red. Then I drew the character on the screen, <laughs> and then I did the swap buffer for the uh, for the double buffering, right? And then um, down here, here's my little while loop down here, which is just doing this. And you can see that while it's doing this part up here, you're going to be in trouble. While it's doing all of this stuff, right, you're going to be in trouble. And because it's not listening for the keystroke. Bad news. Okay? And it is the case that on your my computer here, when the screen's redrawing, can't I type characters all day? So there is a way around this, and the question is how do we get around this? Okay, this is another thing that we—that's kind of really what's what's happening here as well. Okay, all right. What could we do to update this? We need to respond to the events that happen externally, right when they happen. Okay, we can't sit around and go, "Oh, wait for this big screen draw to happen." We have to be able to wait for. We have to be able to say, "Oh, there's a falling clock edge. Boom, go deal with it right now." Okay. This is where these things called interrupts happen. Your Raspberry Pi has the functionality where when something external or even internal, depending on what you're doing, we'll see one later that's a kind of an internal thing, when something happens that your program thinks is important, the Raspberry Pi will say, okay, I'm going to stop your whatever program is running and handle that thing. Right? So if there's a if there's a falling clock edge and you've set it up so that when the Pi sees a falling clock edge, now, what does this mean? You have to have some hardware support for this. It means the Pi is also doing stuff in the background going, okay, I'm checking to see if any of these things have happened and, and, and there. And that's a hardware sort of issue. You're not going to solve that one necessarily with, directly with software unless you stop every instruction and go do so, something. But basically the hardware is saying, okay, you want me to look out for this stuff? I will stop your program and go do this other thing instantly when I find that that thing that you want to happen has happened. All right. So this is really what we want to do. We basically want to say, while we're reading characters from the keyboard, and that's not what we call blocking. In other words, this line here, this line here is going to just kind of, kind of go ahead in the background, if you will, right? It's not going to stop anything from happening. And the update screen thing can just do its thing, and then this will just keep on going and only happen when the keyboard gets a press, okay? This is completely different than all the programming we've done in this class before, okay? It's completely different, all right? It, and it's definitely more advanced. If you're planning on taking CS110, you will see this in a slightly different form uh, when you take CS110, but it's this idea of doing multitasking things at once. But we're going to dig into the details about how that happens for the, the Raspberry Pi. So in other words, keystrokes can come in anytime they want, they're going to be added to some buffer that's going to eventually, when the screen's getting updated, grab from that buffer and say, oh, sure, I'll, I'll grab these, uh, these conditions. This is still not 100% without problems because 
if you happen to be, uh, th th there might be what we call race conditions, which I believe Phil is going to talk about on Monday. And that's where you have to, you have to be a little bit more careful about, oh, okay, I'm going to stop certain things from happening while I'm doing this. Okay. The other interesting thing is when you're doing these things that we're calling interrupts, and it's basically interrupting your program, you want that interrupt to happen as fast as possible. You want to get back to what you were doing as fast as possible. So these interrupts that we're going to see are going to be very small amounts of things. Grab the key from the keyboard, throw it into a buffer, go back to what we were doing before. It's going to be really fast. Yeah, so is the interrupt in this case the while Yeah, in this, w w this isn't, this isn't not interrupt code yet. But yes, and this would be the part where you're going, let's offload this part to happen kind of in the, like when the key gets put down, but it doesn't, allow, it doesn't stop reading at that point. And it also allows it to happen even when update screen is going on. Yes. This is not that code. Oh, so the update screen is not inside the while loop, right? It's just like... No, no, this, this would be the update screen would be in the while loop. It might update screen, update screen, keep updating the screen. Maybe you have other checks to see if there's nothing else that's happened, why update the screen. But yes, you could, you could in other words, and this, again, this code itself is not exactly what we're, the way we're doing it. The idea is we would like this to be the case. We would like it to be the case that whenever a keyboard comes in, in this while, this does not stop things from happening. The update screen can just happen, and whenever you get a key, it adds it to this buffer and then gets handled external, like in a, like very quickly. You'll see. Yeah, Phil? Oh, I see. You know what? I misinterpreted that. Yeah, yeah. So Sorry. Should this should be read care like yeah, from read buffer. from buffer. Yeah. Sorry, I misinterpreted that. Yeah. So this is basically saying this buffer is getting updated whenever it happens. This buffer gets updated with new keys, and in this loop, it goes. Look, if there's any uh, characters in the keyboard, update the screen with those new characters. That's what this is all about. I'll have to change those slides. I misinterpreted that from the slides. Yeah. So it's more of an example of like kind of trying to multitask very quickly, or is it? Um Well, it's kind of multitasking, but it's a little more subtle than that. It's basically saying, I've got my thing that I'm doing. I'm going to wait for some, I'm going to wait for the keyboard to have some characters. When those characters come in, I'm going to take my time writing everything to the buffer, but more characters can come in while I'm doing that. That's the idea here. Okay, so while it's, it's not going to stop more characters from coming in just because you're doing this big, long process. Okay? If you've ever done any web-based programming, you really want your programs to not have little loop like things where this happens as well. It's a, it's a very similar idea with, with events and with, with um, callback functions and things in your web-based program, if you've ever done anything like that, where you want the Have you ever gone to a web page and you're like, wait, I can't, tie, I can't like move my mouse around because it's like doing something in the background? That was bad web programming. Right? There's a way to do that better so that you still can click on buttons and things in the middle. Yeah. Does waiting for the key, you mean here? So, so this, again, this is, I, I misinterpreted. This is basically somewhere in the background, we'll say. Whenever a scan code arrives, it adds to this buffer, okay? And if that buffer ever gets updated, this function will go, oh, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually wait until that happens, and then I'm going to see that there are keys in that buffer, and then I'm going to go to the update screen. While I'm updating the screen, more keys could go into the buffer. By the time I get back to this, I'll find more keys in the buffer and I'll go update the screen again. But maybe there aren't any more and then I'll just wait until more come in. But it like takes like Raspberry Pi some time. Oh, it does take some time? Yeah, 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 sure. When you, you won't be able to notice this because it does happen faster than you can type, and etc. But when you type a key, while it's processing that key, your screen's not getting updated. <laughs> so it could take a little bit longer to do that. Yep. There's a whole field of, um, of programming called real-time computing and real-time processors, which you have to be very careful about these things. A lot of the computers in your car, by the way, if any if you buy a car today, and not even we're not talking like a Tesla, if you buy like a, a you know a Chevy whatever, your car, that car has hundreds of computers in it. Hundreds of them, right? There's one for like there, there's there's one for the engine, or there's lots and lots for the engine, there's things for like the turn signals, there's things for the brakes, there's things for the auto, you know, the ABS brakes, there's all sort of the clutch has computer, all these computers in there. And especially in things like driving along the road in a 3,000 pound car, you want to be able to handle that exactly at the right time every single time. And so things like this actually add to the 
problems with this. You have to be very careful when you're doing this because of that exact problem, where where you don't have the exact timing necessarily. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, you could do, yes, that could be the case. If you were holding down A and it was fast enough to do that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that your buffer can only hold so many things for what it's worth. But, um, but yeah, you would, those, that sort of thing could happen where you're, you're doing that. Now, the thing is, things are fast, but you can update the screen pretty quickly, <laughs> right? You're generally not going to do the, this update where you, do the up, you blank the screen four times in a row before you do anything else. That's probably not really what you're, the best plan anyway. Yeah, good question. Okay, so this is what we want to happen, and I will update this to be buffer um, as we go. So we're going to use interrupts to do this. Okay, and the interrupts is again it causes the computer, the processor, to absolutely pause what it's doing, stop your program. In fact, it does it right at a particular address, and we'll see how that manifests itself in some code in a minute. Um, and then it returns back after it executes that little function, and hopefully that function is fast because you don't want it to be uh, very slow, okay? Um, things that can trigger interrupts, reset will trigger an interrupt, right? You press a reset or you do, do some of the reset, it's gonna stop and go to a reset function that's gonna just wipe the computer, et cetera, okay? Timer functions, we're gonna see one of those today where you've got this timer that's counting down, counting down, and when it stops counting down, or when it gets to zero, it's gonna fire an interrupt and it's gonna go do something. We'll see that. And then, of course, GPIO pins. These are the in most interesting ones, I think, because that's the thing where you're handling the keyboard, or if you get some other sensor for your final project and you need it to whenever that sensor does something, go do this interrupt. Um, that happens. Okay. Uh, you can also have uh, internal events as well. Like, let's say you try to write to a memory address that um, that you, or you try to read from a memory address that you don't actually own or isn't actually in memory. That could trigger an interrupt to go handle it somehow and crack, like gracefully crash the Raspberry Pi, etc. Um, or you could have some sort of software trigger where some other function that's maybe running in the background says, "Oh, I need to do something now," and then it it gets handled. Okay. Um, again. This is if you want things to be responsive. In other words, if you want when you're typing for the keyboard to come up immediately, that's where you have to use these um, these interrupts. Okay, um, interrupts will like really stretch your brain when you start thinking about how they work because not only do you have to think about like what program's happening here and here and what function is happening and when, we have to figure out also we're going to want to know a little bit more about the details of like what's going on under the hood here. And we're going to go through a whole dump of, of how some of this happens in, you've got a, a handout that does some of that too. Okay, um, this involves architecture, involves assembly, linking, it, invol it involves moving actual <coughs> instructions from one place in memory to another place and we'll see how that how that comes about. But it's kind of it's kind of cool in the end. Question. Yeah, like assembly only one instruction it. So it's that once. Correct. It's like kind of one instruction at once, yeah. It's like switch back and forth from check to see if anything was sent, display, check if it was sent. Oh right. Well, okay. Yeah. Well let's step back a little bit more. There's there's a there's you've got your main processor, you've also got your GPU, you've also got other hardware that's doing some other things. They may not be instructions in the same sense. They're their own kind of instructions, but those are those can happen in parallel. So it's not like your computer has is one instruction at a time, no matter what. There's various little peripheral things happening also in parallel. Yeah. It, processor design is fascinating because of all those little pieces that have to fit together. Yeah, Phil? I think a good example, that's the serial part. Right? Yeah. The serial part, write this byte, and then it just goes, and then yeah. uh, the hardware is clocking out those bits, right, while your your processor is running. Yeah, that's a good point. So the serial is doing. By the way, if you really wanted to, you could probably rewrite our keyboard driver uh, almost because of the way keyboards work. It's a little more tricky, but to use some of that hardware to help out in this, the hardware actually when when your key when you're um, uh, when you are doing a boot the bootloader and it's doing that serial communication, or whenever you're doing printf and it does the serial communication, um, the, the UART in there has a little buffer of its own for about eight keystrokes or so, or eight characters. So you have enough time to do other stuff while it's pulling it in, so that it, uh, that, that you ha it, but it is doing it in parallel. It's just doing it in a different place in memory, a different place in hardware, with its own memory and so forth, handling that. Somebody else had their hand up? No? Okay. All right. So anyway, um, we are going to do this. And by the way, you're going to use interrupts next week to handle the exact problem I showed you, which was whenever you type a key, 
it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily grab it instantly because you're doing other stuff on the screen. So you're going to actually have to update that for the last assignment. It was kind of fun. Okay, let's take a look. For basically, the rest of the time, we're going to take a look at this code called Blink. Okay, and this is, you've got this code. So if you look at the handout, if you didn't get the handout, they're in the back. Um, the side that is, uh, the side that says all the includes at the top is the actual Blink program. Okay, we are going to look through it. In fact, the one I'm going to show you, oh, I'll show you, I'll, I'll show it to you, I'll show you it running right now. Okay, uh, let's see. While you're getting that, I'll set this up. Blink, here we go. Okay. Yeah, let's just make, install. All right, let me reset my pie. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see the little light blinking, but I assure you that um, what's going to happen when I run this, I'll, well, you'll see what happens when I run it. Um, what's happening is it's going to do this, and then it's starting the blink, and then every time it, you get something up there, Okay, the little green light is coming on in the pie, the ACT light is coming in the pie, and it's just every, basically every second or so, it's basically firing one of these interrupts, jumping to a particular place in the code, and uh, doing that. So if you look at the code, let's check, I'll bring it up on the, I'll bring it up on the screen, okay, link.c, okay, um, we have this, well, let's look at main first, why not? Okay, we're going to initialize our GPUs, we're going to set the ACT LED to be an output because we're going to set it on and off, that's the green light. We're going to initialize the UINT. This is in your code, I took it out so that I can, we can do this in GDB in a minute. And then we set a couple things here, okay? And we're going to go into some of the details about this. But there's a function that says arm timer enable interrupts, okay? And this is saying, oh, okay, um, we're going to go and uh, set up a timer. It's a hardware timer that's going to count down one million times. Okay, and it does that every, I don't know, clock cycle or whatever it is. I don't know exactly how often it does that, but it's roughly a second for that. And then we're going to uh, enable that timer. Okay, then we have to what we do, we have to do what we call enable interrupts. We have to basically tell the computer, tell the Pi, uh, by the way, we're using interrupts now because the whole class so far we haven't been using these things, so it didn't need to be set up. That's in there, okay. Then we're going to actually enable some interrupts, the particular one, in this case the timer interrupt. We'll see that in some of the H files in a minute. And then we're going to do some more, then we're going to actually do this. This is an interesting one. Interrupts attach handler. Okay, we have written a little program right at the top here, uh, call, or we have written a little function called interrupt handler. What's the first thing you notice about this function? It's really short, right? Again, we want our interrupt functions to be short because this is going to be happening while our program is doing something else, and maybe we don't want that other thing to be interrupted for very long. It's going to do that, but it's going to go to this, this code up here, and it is going to, in this case, clear the interrupt. In other words, it's going to say, okay, I've handled what I need to handle, right? And then it's going to update a counter. That's it. It's very fast. It's going to then it's going to return back to whatever normal programming was happening, right? Whatever was normal normally happening. Okay, and then um, and then we've got a couple other. We've attached the handler that's here. Okay, and then we've enabled global interrupts. So there's a few different types of interrupts. If those, these details are uh, we'll have to think about them, but they're not not important right this second. And then we are basically going to go into our little while loop here. How much blinking is going on in this, like, or how much actual timing is going on here? It's basically saying, okay, if last is not equal to the counter, okay, then we're going to set last equal to the counter, and then we're going to toggle the interrupt, okay, and then we're going to, um, uh, we are going to print out this little message that says, oh, I've received another interrupt. I've received so many interrupts so far, okay. Here, right, where do we update counter in here? Anywhere? No, we don't, we don't do the counter anywhere in here, right? We have the counter as, oh, guess what? It's volatile. Does that make sense while this one's going to be volatile? If this wasn't volatile, now, in many cases, the global variables end up kind of volatile anyway, but if we didn't make it volatile, wouldn't we get into that situation where the compiler would go, well, wait a minute, 
count last is zero and counter some value and I'm never changing it, can't I just go into an infinite loop here and not ever do any more checking? Remember that from the lab the other day? That's what happened in the lab where that happened. So we have to make this volatile to say, oh, guess what? This counter is going to get updated somewhere else. Okay, it's not necessarily getting updated by hardware like a GPIO pin or whatever. It's getting updated in software by this, this interrupt timer we're talking about. In fact, our code way up here. Okay? All right. So that's the, that's the basic outline of what the code looks like. Okay? And it will just keep doing this forever and just keep updating every second, basically. Okay? All right. So the timer... <coughs> When it happens, it triggers this interrupt. The interrupt stops whatever's happening in that while loop. It goes to the handler function, does the handler function, and then goes back to the interrupt, which is now checking for a counter change. And if the count, once the counter actually changes, it then toggles the light and prints out that nice message that says um, that. Okay, again, counter is declared volatile because it has to be. Otherwise, it would the compiler would go, oh, you're never changing this again, not bothering to. Um, do the code you think you want to do. Okay. Now, how is interrupt handler called? Ah, this is the part that we have to start thinking about. Okay. All right. So, first of all, what questions do you have about that so far? Yeah, Jacob. Is it possible for the interrupt to trigger like during, like in, in between, like last equals counter and toggle the zero? Uh, yeah, sure. If it toggled in the middle, of that, that, that wouldn't actually affect the, uh, the, our program because it would just immediately have another, it would immediately check the counter and go, oh, I got another, right? Now, I thought your question was going to be, can an interrupt happen inside an interrupt, right? Oh. And that's another kind of question where we have to say, oh, well, what's actually happening here? It turns out that, uh, let's see, in general, interrupts, when you call an interrupt, when an interrupt happens, all other interrupts are stopped. Once you enable them again, you say, I'm clearing it, then other ones can happen. There's a priority that goes on. Certain interrupts are higher priority than other ones. And if you are in a lower priority interrupt and get interrupted, then the other interrupt might happen. And then go back to your interrupt and then happen and it cascades down. And then the most important interrupt will not get interrupted while it's in the middle of its uh, thing. Yeah. Yep. Um. The LED toggling is, I should have put line numbers on here, it is right here on line 50. As in like, because this is a function. Pi LED toggle? Yeah. Yeah, that's in a different, that's in the library somewhere. Okay. We wrote it earlier or whatever, and it will toggle that LED on and off. Okay? Maybe you never wrote that. James? So this counter is going to make each time we have, I guess, something added to the buffer? There's no buffer in this case. There's just a counter which gets updated every time the timer counts down to zero. And by the way, the timer keeps going. It starts back up at a million again, and it counts down to zero. It starts back up, and then triggers the interrupt, starts and goes back to a million, counts down, et cetera, and just does that forever. That's how these, these timers actually interrupt. Okay? Am I correct? This is called a watchdog timer. Is that the... I might be getting that wrong. No, this is not a watchdog timer. That's different. Okay. It's just a timer. <laughs> I'll look that one up later. But okay. So anyway, other questions on this? What's happening here? All right. So let's talk about how this process actually happens, or happens. Okay. There are on your Raspberry Pi eight different types of interrupts. Now, if you count here, you'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you'll notice that this one and this one happen to be the same, right? <laughs> so there, there are eight different types. In this case, the resets are going to be the same. We'll see why that makes a difference in a, in a few minutes. But here's the different types of things that could happen. Okay, you could have the reset, like you reset the processor and it just goes and up and, and starts everything over again. You could have an undefined instruction. If for some reason, somehow, you've, you've jumped to some location that's not an instruction that the Pi understands, it will crash, basically. It'll basically send an interrupt to this function here, that whatever that is, undefined instruction, and it will deal with it somehow. How it deals with it, depending on how, what you've written, we're not going to bother with that one. Okay. Software interrupts. That's the one where some other function triggers a an interrupt that goes and does something. Okay, um, or your soft your program will can trigger an interrupt to go do something else. Okay, um, prefetch abort. I'm not even sure what that one is. 
not sure. It's, a, it's some other, maybe while it's going to get the instruction, something bad happens to the memory, or maybe there's a, but not need to know you were at that. Same with data abort, some other issues going on there. Reset happens again. Here's the one we're really going to care about for us. Interrupt assembly. This one happens when we do things like trigger a GPIO, trigger a timer, etc. This is the one that's going to happen most. And then fast ASM is what we call a fast interrupt, um, which is supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be, another, it's, it's one where you're like, look, I really need to do this right now and it has to be like super duper fast because of whatever reason and it's going to be last. And it turns out having it last makes a big difference too because you can actually save a jump if everything after that instruction is your the next pro, the next uh, instruction that you want to uh, do. So it's just it's basically saying, look, we know there's cases where you might need to do things like super duper fast. Most of the time we probably won't, but sometimes there might be. And there you go. Okay. And then we have um, all of these uh, these functions. Notice they start with an underscore. This function loads into the PC. What is happening when you're loading a value into the PC? You're moving, you're actually jumping to whatever location you just, or whatever address you just moved into the PC, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to load PC with whatever uh, reset ASM is in this case, okay? And it's whatever the address of the function is. That we're going to walk through GDB and see this in a few minutes, okay? Turns out for most of ours, we have these impossible things happening, which basically says, look, for our programs, this will never happen, but we still have to define a function to do that. And in fact, if you see the impossible ASM function, it's kind of funny. It says, this shouldn't happen, <laughs> something like that. But it's basically because when we're writing these, this code, if that happens, something really bad uh, went, went on. And then this is the one we're going to actually care about for ours. Okay? This is called the, well, this is the vectors thing. We have to set that up, as it turns out. Okay? We being like, if we're looking at, ra at bare metal Raspberry Pi here, Okay, when you do this again, it loads the PC with the address over here, and that value is where it jumps to. So the actual function that it jumps to is going to be uh, word inter it's going to be interrupt ASM function. Okay, so the function that's going to be the address of a function there. Okay, all right. Uh, how is interrupt ASM called? Well, how is interrupt ASM is called? There's a little typo there. Uh, how is it called? Well, this is, we have to get into some of the details of this, but the idea is your interrupt jumps to this location in the vectors up here, loads that interrupt value into the PC, and that's how it goes there. Again, we're going to see that in a, in a few minutes. Okay? And the difference between underscore inter interrupt ASM and underscore inter interrupt ASM, what's the difference there? Yeah? Well, one of them is like the actual location of the instruction. One of them is the actual location of the instruction, which is which one? The underscore is the location of the instruction that you're, well, yes, of the, the location of the address of the instruction you're going to actually jump to. Yeah. Okay. The other one is the actual instruction, <laughs> like the, the location of the actual instruction itself. <coughs> you'll see that in a second. Again, we're going to walk through this and you'll see it in a second. Check. What's underscore vectors? So this is, this is defining this, this actual vector table. We're going to see that in the code in a second about how this actually gets populated into memory. Phil? Just a label. That's storing the value over here. Again, so this this interrupt these interrupts are very interesting in that there's like six different levels of interaction you have to do to get to the actual function. I'm going to show you that. It's it's we have to kind of wrap our heads around it, but uh, but you'll see when we when we get to that in a few minutes. Okay. All right. Um, how does the system know when to call when what to call when an interrupt occurs? Well, it looks in this table. It, it loads. It's it's already got that vector address. It goes to there, jumps to there, and then that's where the next stuff happens. You'll, you'll see that again as we go along. So on your sheet again, on the other page, okay, we haven't really looked too much at C start. We looked at it a little bit. But C start here, that's the first thing that happens before main. Okay, we always said, oh, main's the first thing that happens. It's not. Remember, C start happens. And 
Phil talked about this when he said, hey, don't we have to update the BSS and load in all those zeros so that our global variables are zeroed out and so forth? This is what's happening in C start. Okay, but we're going to update C start to also do this interesting thing here. Okay, we are going to say this. We are going to say static int star RPI interrupt vector base, which is a pointer, equals zero. What does that mean? What location, where are we going to put these vectors? Right at location zero. We're putting it at basically at null point, <laughs> right? Well, which means that if you happen to have a bug in your printf somewhere, and your printf went and wrote to location null, because you forgot to check for null pointer as some value or whatever, you are going to mess up your vector table. Okay? In most code that you write, like if you were in CS107 and were writing code, every time you try to write to location zero, it seg faults and your computer program crashes and you go, oh, I have a bug and you go fix it. On your Raspberry Pi, so far, whenever you write to location zero, the Pi goes, okay, fine with me. <laughs> Go right ahead. I don't care what's there. You seem to know what you're doing. And, and then that's it. From now on, you're going to have to watch that, watch out for that, right? Which means that you should have been watching out for it before, but now, well, uh, you may have to debug some things that you worked on like a month ago, right? Because of the fact that you didn't think about this and that happened. So it's too bad in that case. But the point here is that we are going to write these locations to vector to the location zero. Okay, and then um, and then we have our uh, vector's destination here, right? Which is um, where the RPI inter. That's what we're just setting here. Okay, we're gonna. That's the same one. Okay, and then we're going to basic, and that's just a different address so that we can keep track of the original. Okay, that that one's constant. And then we're going to get the location of that vector's array that we saw earlier. We are going to know how big it is, and then we're going to copy over those locations right to address zero, address four, address eight, address twelve, etc. Okay, and that's where we have to actually copy. And, and why do we have to copy them to that location? They can't. They don't get loaded there by anything else, right? They're in our program wherever C start happens to live, we have to copy those values into location zero to say, here is where all your definitions of the functions live. Okay? All right. A couple other things before we look at the actual code on this. Okay. We've seen this before, right? Where we have a stack, and we have a heap, and we have a uh, our, our BSS and our uh, read-only data and our data and our program, etc. And then way down here is where our interrupts are going to live. Okay, um, we've seen this uh, here. Um, interesting. The question is, why does this actually work? <laughs> like, why does it work when you actually do the interrupt uh, address up here like this? Anybody know why this is actually going to work? Like, the why we even ask this question? Like, why does the code work if it's copied to address zero? Wouldn't necessarily work if it was a, if it was somewhere else. Turns out that these locations, because they're zero and they're relative addresses, well, a relative address from zero is just that number. So that's kind of interesting in that sense. I mean, there's there's a method to why we put these things right at, at zero. It's because, oh, it's going to make figuring that out easier. We won't have to do any other updating and things like that. Phil, you have a comment? Yeah, so actually, you go back to the previous slide. Yep. Another way to think of this is, Tries to, or the assembler tries to be smart and help you with 
And since you're actually moving where the code is, you need to ex you need to like explicitly name the address so it doesn't tell you something else. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, hilarity in series. Right. Remember, we're doing something very weird here, right? We're actually copying, um, we're actually copying like code from one location to another location, and that's weird. Like we've never done that before, right? There's there's something kind of strange about like you're copying your actual assembly code into a different part of memory. It's definitely something a little different. Okay. All right. So the actual interrupt handler here. Okay. Here's what it is. Now, we have to jump into assembly some more here for this, okay? What we're going to do is we are going to do the following. We'll see why this happens in a minute, okay? And take a look at this for a second. We're going to move the stack pointer to location 8,000. Wait, what lives at 8,000? Our program lives at 8,000. Oh, my gosh. Are we going to overwrite our program? Why or why not? Stack goes down, right? So the top of the stack is 8,000 now, and it's going this way. So it's actually fine because nothing else lives there right now, okay? So it's not like we're, we're going to overwrite our code. We're going to do that, okay? Then we're doing this weird thing. We're doing sub LRLR for changing the link register. Why would we ever care about changing the link register back to a location that is, yeah, what do you think, John? Any ideas? Maybe that, that line of code, if the interrupt hits, while that line of code is, is being executed, like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the three monkeys, three bananas thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 the monkeys and bananas, yeah, yeah. yeah like that, mm -hmm. that code's, that's where the link register is, but the code hasn't, like, hasn't actually been executed. Yeah, this, but, these interrupts happen, and when the interrupt happens, the link register will probably be set to a value. It ends up branching to a value based on the link. It's going to end up, we have to go back to the original location where we jump, where we got interrupted. So that's going to have to happen here, okay? Then it's going to push all the registers. Why are we going to push all the registers? Like all of them, like 0 through 12 and then LR. Why are we pushing all of those? What's a good idea for that? Yeah. Because that new function may need to access. That new function is going to do its own thing, thing, right? And yes, we probably could have written the interrupt so that it handles this in the same way that it, that, but we're just going to say, look, we've got to just push everything on there because we, we need to save it there. And then later we'll, we'll, get him back. So it's just like keeping track of our own resource and saying, we don't know what that interrupt handler is going to do with all the registers. Let's just save them all and be, be good to go. Okay. Then it's going to um, move R0 to the link register, right? R0 is what's going to be, what is R0 always? It's like the first, the func, the name, like the, the it's the uh, first parameter, etc. right? It's going to do this. It's going to move that to the link register and then it's going to branch to our interrupt handler so it knows how to come back to uh, the old one. It's not going to bother coming back to our, well, it's actually it's going to come back to our code here. Right, it's going to come back to our code here and then we're going to pop, and then we're going to jump back to the, the uh, LR there. Question? We'll see that in a minute. We'll see that in a minute, but it's basically because when you call that, you need to go, you're, you don't want to jump to the one after the instruction. You want to jump back to the instruction that hasn't actually gone yet. Right. It's going to interrupt it right there. What's that? Like whenever you re leave a function, don't you want an, whenever we branch somewhere, don't we always branch back? We, we return back to the one instruction below it? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what, because that instruction hasn't happened yet. So we need to go back to the one that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Turns out that's the, that's the big issue there. Okay, here we already talked about some of this, okay? Where do we save all the registers? On our original stack or our new stack or what? New, new stack. stack. New stack. That's, you know, new stack. Great. Okay. All right. This is now kind of what it looks like. Now we've got the same. We've got that now interrupt stack on there and the interrupt <coughs> code on there. Okay. This is the big issue here. Okay. The interrupt occurs right before some instruction. But at that point, okay, the P, what's the PC at that point? PC is already how much ahead? Well, I guess eight or four. Really, four. Let's think of it as four right now. If it's four ahead, then it has to jump back. We have that's the reason that we're going to like go back to the the the, inter the instruction right here because this instruction hasn't actually happened yet, <coughs> but the uh, but the actual PC has been updated already. So then, when it branches, it's going to oh, there. Okay, where can we store that information about about where the where can we store that? Say again. 
new stock. I think, is that where it gets? It does get stored on the, no. Phil's going, no. Where's that one getting stored? Not even sure. Oh, I didn't know that. The interrupt context, okay. It's being stored in the LR. Oh, it's the, yeah, well, we'll get there in one second. Okay, so, yeah, well, turns out we have more and more registers than we let on before, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, okay, we kind of already, we already did this. In the interrupt handler, what, what value is passed to the interrupt handler? It is actually the, because we're moving, uh, what is actually getting passed? It's the new link register, so that we're going to know, um, we're, we're put it, the link register we just gave, that's what's getting passed into the interrupt handler. So it knows where it came from, basically. Okay. All right. Okay. Last thing before we start looking at code, and I do want to have time to look at this code. We do have time. All right. So it turns out there's lots of different modes of your processor. We didn't cover this at all yet because it didn't even matter yet. Okay. We, you've got unprivileged mode. Now, if you're in an, if you are running a program in an operating system like Linux, okay, you're basically going to be running in in unprivileged mode, which means you can't mess things up that the that the uh, that the operating system is in control of. Okay, this is basically to stop hacking, right? And it's to stop. It's also to stop your programs from just misbehaving in general, which is also. But it's also very good for like stop hacking. If your program is running in unprivileged mode, it can't write to that null pointer. It can't because the processor it has to everything has to go through the operating system in that case. Okay, we could be in interrupt mode, which is now an interrupt has happened. We can be in fast interrupt, meaning a fast interrupt mode means a fast interrupt has happened. We can be in supervisor mode, which is privileged, and that's where reset happens, and um, and and that's where uh, basically reset and so forth happens. We've got a couple other interesting mode, abort and undefined instructions. Those are some when those other uh, interrupts happen, and then you've got system mode, which is where it's privileged mode that shares the user's registers. Right? This is now where you're going to say, okay, I've actually got the same set of registers. In the other cases, it turns out, guess what? We have a whole different set of registers now. And some are shared in various modes, and some are not in various modes. And this is what Phil was alluding to, in that, that we are saving those registers. There's a kind of a separate set of registers used in these different modes so that we don't have to go and worry about saving all these registers and saving and doing a lot of stuff. You can have these things kind of going at the, the same. It's going to speed things up so you don't have to kind of always continually share back and forth. you have more comments on that one, Phil? Yeah, I think the thing that's really hard to wrap your head around is that the interrupt's like a function that can be called at any time. Like any instruction in your program is not going to be called. And you have all these rules about like the ABI, about like, oh, these registers are saved, your registers are we call a function, the infrastructure is filled in. And suddenly, it's as if the program, like, you have to hack it at any time. It gets really, really hard. So the hardware actually can give you a little bit of help. Otherwise, boom, the interrupt is called, and the register is blown away, right? And all your registers are blown away, and all these bad things happen. And so the hardware actually can help you a little bit. Otherwise, you know, no code could run correctly. And the just, I mean, Chris was presenting is like, here's sort of the way you do it. But it's totally the case that the bug in this, I, I was talking from Boston a couple of weeks ago, where he was beating his head for six hours against something that turned out he didn't save one register in this interrupt handler. So suddenly in the middle of his code, he was just getting corrupted. Like some register of seven that had a bad value in it. He had no idea why. So this is... Yeah, the, the, when, you, when you get into this, these details of like, your program expects the system to be in exactly the right form, and then you go and jump somewhere else. If you don't save things, if you don't do some things where you're going to uh, keep track of or you don't have a little more help from the hardware, it can blow up really easily. And it also can make hard debugging when you try to go into these supervisor modes, supervisor modes and all this too, where you're not paying attention. And the thing for me is like, this is, this is, I mean, Nick was like, this is tricky stuff that we're mm -hmm. supposed to work out. But on the other hand, what's it's so foundational for like, you mobile every computer process the key without missing <laughs> yeah. it, right? Without yeah. missing it, right? And that way they're just sort of so fun. Yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so anyway, do we do we really need them to know all those details about this? No. These are things you can look up. You can say, oh, look, if you're in, if you happen to be in fast interrupt mode, you're going to be sharing some of the registers, but not other ones. You've got your own and, and so forth. But just know that this exists. If you ever go build an operating system, you're going to have to think about this stuff. 
Um, and uh, yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah, go ahead, Jane. <coughs> This is the way ARM decided it was going to happen. Yeah, they, they, people had to make these decisions. It's not like this is, oh, it has to be this way. But they made some good decisions. You know, they made it nice that we put the vectors at the beginning, the interrupts at the beginning, so you can do this you know, uh, process where you load them correctly and all that uh, without too much work. Nice like that. Okay. Um, when you're returning from the interrupt, get, get all the registers back, and then just move the PC to that link register, which you've now updated by minus four, so it goes back to the exact instruction that would, would have been executed if you didn't get interrupted, and then you just continue on. Okay? All right. Could this code have been written in C? You're going to have a tough time writing all that in C, right? Because you have to deal with the, the registers, and you have to deal with the like, little, real hardware stuff. So if you're writing an operating system, you're going to have to get into the assembly no matter what processor you're on to do this level of work. You can't build your entire operating system in C, unfortunately. But that's the way it goes. Okay, now, for the last few minutes, here's what I want to do. I want to look through the Blink code in GDB. Okay? It's not going to be as easy to do it on the Pi itself. So we're going to do this in GDB. Uh, and it is going to, we're going to do it this way. R muted GDB blink.elf. Uh, okay. All right. So here's what I want to do. I just want to find, I want to figure out if we can get to that vector or that interrupt handler that we have. Okay. If we list our, let's see, what list here. Okay. I want to get to that location. Let's actually look at this. Did you, do you know you can do this? You can do print the address of interrupt Oh, it's not going to work yet. I got to hang on. We're going to do target sim load break. Break. I'm not going to break on main right now. I'm going to break on C start. Okay, and I'm going to just run it for right now. Okay, and let's see. Uh, which file are we in here? Is it blink.c? Uh, if we list blink.c colon interrupt handler. Yeah, there we go. That's our interrupt handler. We can actually, I believe, print the address of that. Oh, sorry. Maybe it's not going to let us do this. It may need to... There we go. Okay. We have just printed... I printed the address of the interrupt handler. So if we go and look at the 8064 address, D-I-S-I-S 0x8064, right? That is our interrupt handler. Okay, so there's the code for our interrupt handler. All right. We're going to try to get there <laughs> using figuring out going from address zero where the interrupt is going to, well, the, one of the addresses near zero to see what that happens, see how that happens. Okay, so where did we say that vector table lived? Address zero. Let's do this. Let's look at DISAS 0x0. And it says no function contains a specified address. Bummer. Turns out you can do this in GDB. You can say x slash, let's say we want to look at... Um, Oh, I don't know, 30 instructions, right? It will interpret them as instructions. X slash 30i, or sorry, yeah, 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 X slash, this one I want to do? Yeah, X slash 30i at 0x0, and there we go. All right, so this is right when the program starts. Take a look at what our instructions are doing. It says load PC, PC, uh, load, load from address 0x840 and then branch to 2278, that doesn't quite look like our vectors yet. It turns out when the Pi starts up, this gets populated, I think, immediately, and then this is not quite garbage, but for our purposes, it's kind of garbage right now. Okay? All right, so what, well, we're just looking at this. When the program first starts, this is kind of garbage at location zero, although it might be doing something very low level for the Pi in general. Okay? But if we look at where we are in our uh, function, if we look at where we are in C start. Actually, I'm just going to run it again just to make sure that we're there. There we go. Okay. So here's where we are. If we look at our uh, code here, this is in C start. Remember, we said that we have to do the following. We have to copy this interrupt, interrupt vector table into memory, right? So we've defined it. We've placed all the addresses in the right place for all of our functions, and we're going to copy that in here. And that's what all this code is actually going to do. Okay, it's going to uh, copy that for us. All right, make sense? That's that's what's going to happen. 
All right. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to let's go. Let's break on like line 35 here. Break on line 35, which is here. Okay. All right. And then if we continue, there we go. Now we're on line 35, and we are about to do this. We said that we set the vector destination vector ds vectors dst. There we go. I think I got that to no <laughs> to zero. Right? And then we are going to, uh, we're going to actually go in and copy them all over. This is the whole copying business. We are now taking our defined vectors and we're copying the locates to zero so that the interrupts know where to happen. Okay? All right. So I'm just going to break on main and continue this program so it does that. Let's look at the addresses. Let's look at location zero again. Oh, now we're cooking. Take a look at top, up top here. Okay, what do we have? We've got load PC at PC plus we're going to load the PC is going to be 38, right? And it's going to then it's going to be three C's the next one and four zero and four et cetera et cetera et cetera. Notice something three eight. Uh, let's see, three eight is there, and three eight's also down here. Remember that vector table where I said reset happens twice. This is what's happening here. Okay, but let's actually take a look at some of that. Okay, we've got, if we go down, back down here, and if we look at location 38, if we look at location 38, x slash x, let's do eight of them, 8x at 0x38, those look like nice addresses. Okay, those right there, those are what's going to get loaded. It's going to load that value and then jump there is basically what's going to happen. Let's do this. D-I-S-A-S 0x8C68. That was the first one that we were going to jump to. Oh, look. It's reset ASM. Great. That means that we're going to actually go to that uh, location or if we want to reset. If we look at the code again, remember which one was our interrupt vector? Let's look up here. It is the one we care about was, where's the one? There we go. Which one do we care about? We care about this one, right? It's like the second to last one, the interrupt one. That's actually going to be, let's see, which one? It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's actually going to be, I believe, this one as it turns out. P0X8, oh, sorry, D-I-S-A-S-0X8C4C. Ah, it's because reset got was twice, it actually put them right next to each other. So it turns out it's not. <laughs> You'd think that would be it, but it's not. But it turns out this is the one we're looking for. Okay? Our interrupt ASM. So this is where it's going to jump. Okay? So it's going to jump here. Okay? And we that's where we're going to go when we get this interrupt for our blink. Okay? All right. Let's actually do a little bit more here, okay, in our code. Let's see, where are we here? We are, ah, we are inside main right now, okay? If we look here, we're inside main. I'm going to just keep going down here. I'm going to arm the timer, and I'm going to enable the interrupts, I'm going to enable the interrupts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then now we're down, uh, now we're in here. Now let's actually see what happens when we go into the interrupt handler. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. X slash 20i 0x0. Okay. So at 0x0, we're going to look at the, the one that's going to be our uh, interrupt handler. So x slash 8x uh, 0x38, I believe, is the one that we wanted. Okay. 38. And 38 was uh, this one. 8, 0, so 6, 8. If we do that, D-I-S-A-S 0x8C6, 8. Okay. It's going to go there. Okay. Now what's going to happen? Okay, now what's going to happen is we are going to um, branch to there. Okay, and what do we have to do there? We we are now in the interrupt vector. Okay. Oh no, I didn't. We're not. Sorry, wrong one. It's not three eight, is it? It is C four eight C four C eight C four C. There we go. That's the interrupt one. Okay. Now we're going to be in there. What's going to happen? This is where we're saving, pushing all the registers, and we're jumping, and we're <coughs> doing, and then we're chain, we're subbing the LR by four. This is the same sort of thing we're doing, happening there. Pushing the LR, pushing all the registers. Then we're moving R zero into LR, okay, and then we are going to branch to 
8A58. Well, let's look at 8A58. Uh, DISAS 0x8A58. Okay. 8A58 is this whole business here. All right. This is now where it's going to, it turns out that you can set multiple interrupts to happen. Okay. So we'll do like the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. It will go through and look at a whole list of those interrupts as it, as it turns out. Okay. And R5 in here is, locate, is loaded with that address. If we look at that address, 0x8aa0, okay, right? This is, um, if, we, if we look at that address, let's see, um, we actually get the address of the first address it's going to branch to, <laughs> okay? The address of the first address it's going to branch to, which is, let's see, um, let's actually, instead of doing that, let's actually look at it here. There, that's what it is. 9B04. Do you ever remember what 9B04 was? Hmm, nothing. It's nothing. Okay, well, let's look at it this way. X, uh, 9B04. Oh. Turns out there's where we're going to store all of our various addresses that we can jump to during our vector. We're basically going to look through, we're going to get an interrupt, we're going to look through a whole bunch of handlers that we might call, and we're going to jump to <coughs> one in order. We already put one there at location 0x8604, DISAS 0x8064, that is our interrupt handler. Whew. There's a whole bunch of indirection happening here to get to your interrupt handler. Why? It's got to go to the vector table. It's got to go from the vector table. It's got to find the right address. It's then got to go to an actual interrupt handler program that, or interrupt um, table that got loaded for our for each interrupt handler that, or each interrupt that we want to call. Then it's got to find the right one there, and then it's got to jump there. So we had like six different levels of interaction, but we finally made it to our interrupt handler. Okay, I know that was a lot of like GDB like business, but that's how it works. This was day one on interrupts. We actually get two full days of interrupts. Phil's going to talk about them on Monday. So, um, so if you're processing this uh, over the weekend, don't uh, don't stress. If you're like, I still have questions about that, you can put them on Piazza or ask other ones. What questions do you have in the last couple minutes we have? Yeah, Jane. Well, we're going to be able to connect our pins up to, say, the keyboard or some external thing. And then we're going to be able to say to it, and this is what you're going to write for your homework, we're going to be able to say to it, hey, when this gets triggered, go to your interrupt panel and collect the keyboard bits. One bit at a time, as it turns out. We want it to be fast enough to do one bit at a time. Phil is going to go over this on Monday where he's going to show you a button that actually does it. When you click the button, it's going to go to your interrupt handler. And that's exactly the same as your keyboard. And your keyboard just exactly doing that? Yeah. So essentially, anytime, like, is it like anytime I have virtuals to my system coming from the outside? You know, are there the interrupts that I can take? Whenever you have, well, if you've set it up, if you've set your Pi up to trigger, to call an interrupt on that GPIO pin happen, changing, then it will go to that. But you have to set it up. You don't have to go through this process of saying, okay, here's the interrupt handler, and in, um, in blink.as, or blink.c, you can, whoops, even in blink, uh, in blink.c, You'll see down here it says, um, it says, uh, attach handler. That's where you're saying, okay, now, now you know about where these, like where you've set up all your vector table, make this one go into that array of all the handlers and it gets called when the function happens. But well, like in your car example, like in most robot systems, is that sort of like something that's actually most actually yeah, there? It's, the yeah, there are lots of ish, like, things like that. When, when you, when you're, uh, car gets in a uh, when you, when your car like gets in a front end collision or something like that, right? There's going to be a sensor in there that's going to go, oh, I got to trigger the airbags, right? And how's that happen? There's a little, there's a basically a, a, wait, a loop waiting to or a little loop in one of those computers that says, oh, did this accelerometer change and have a certain rate? Boom, go, and then that's when the airbag goes. It just stop everything, and that's exactly the next thing that's going to happen. Yeah. Now there's 60 computers that are all going to react at that same time because of various issues, but yeah, one of them's going to be down. What else? All right. Good luck on your frame buffers. We'll see you guys Monday. <laughs>
Okay. Like one first thing is like, mm -hmm. why did you put it in an assert? I thought assert was like to check. Yeah. Turns out if you do and if you attach a handler, and you probably attach too many already, or it just doesn't work, that's going to return false. And if it returns false, you want your program just to crash. Okay. He's basically saying, look, yeah. did you, did you, were you able to attach this handler? If you weren't, I got a crash. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. Awesome. Also, I didn't really understand the relationship between, like, by because, uh, uh, like, the 0x0, zero zero, like, place, and also the 0x, like, 800 something, and also, like, the, like, see. underscore. When there you were, we're, like, in GDP, you oh, were yeah. showing us, like, the last thing that we saw yep. was, like, 0... Uh, it was like zero x eight something something, and then you're like, oh, this is like so familiar. And I I thought it was gonna be in zero x zero, because. Well, okay, let's let's do a look right here. So I've got it running. Here. If we look at yeah. zero x zero, I just stopped it in the middle, of it, like in the main. So we look at zero x zero. Okay, this is our table, and if we look at that location, zero x three eight, right? Why are you looking into? Because it's about to load the PC with whatever is at location 0x38. Which well, means. Like, I thought it was like load the PC with like these values, right? It's basically going to do this. It's going to say, it's basi well, it's basically going to load, it's going to load the, it's going to basically do 48 plus whatever the PC is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if we, and it, turned out and it turns address. out to be address 38. Okay. Right, whatever it's going to load it with ever that address. Yeah. So it goes down. So we look at that address. We go. Yeah. Where are we currently in Maine? We're in Maine somewhere. Okay. Right? I mean, if you look, where are we? We can we can go through and we can go to. Let's see. We've already done that. So we're about to go through our while loop here, like our print up here. Whatever. We're about to go. We're about to say starting blink. Yeah. Okay. All right. If we look again, if we look at our instructions. 38, 3C, 4044, 48. Okay, 38 again is going to be that. So 4C is the one we care about. That's where our oh, interrupt like is going to happen. Sounds like but let's look at that. So this is the table of addresses? Yeah, well, this is actually addresses. What happens is when the interrupt get calls, it jumps to this location. And then this location, it says, oh, okay, what am I going to do next? I'm going to load the PC with this value, and I'm going to jump there. Okay. Well, let's look at what's at 4C. 8C, 4C. Things in the 8,000s, we go, oh, that's probably our program. Is it our program? Let's see. D-I-S-I-S, 0X, 8C, 4C. Who oh, it is. It's an interrupt ASM. That's a function. And that's the function that we actually, I didn't show you that one, but that's written in the, um, in the code, okay? And then interrupt, .a, interrupt ASM does what? Well, it does a whole bunch of things here where it's going to... Um, Look at our go to our. It's going to store all the vector, store all the registers, yeah. and it's going to jump to this interrupt vector program, which has a list of all the handle, all the instruct oh, handles. Wait. We have. So interrupt ASM is also like a little bit. So this is like doing preparation before you go to the interrupt. This is doing preparate. This is actually the interrupt has happened already. Interrupt has happened, but now this is doing preparation before we jump to our code. Let's keep following it through, right? So let's see what happens. We do a bunch of, we push a bunch of registers on here. We do, uh, we then um, branch to this location, a a eight a five eight. Okay, so let's do that. Eight a five eight. Okay, at eight a five eight. Now we're doing some other. Things. We're pushing a whole bunch of other registers on. We're doing some other setup and things, and then we are going to load from eight. 8AA0. A, a okay. And let's look at that. X slash X, 0X, 8AA0. A, a okay. That is 9B04. And that happens to be 9B04. Actually, is this the one? No, no, sorry. I think 0X9. I did the same thing in class. Yeah. 9B04 is an array of all of the addresses of our functions. This one is where our code is. List 0x8. I thought you said that. Uh, well, like I think I'm like mixing up array and vectors. I thought you said like the vectors of all the functions is in 0x0. 
there's lots of indirection happening here. You jump to Xerox, zero, zero, then you jump here, then you jump here, then you jump here, then you finally jump to your program. That's what I was trying to show you. Oh, so like this is where the program So what were you, you were saying about? Like you want to start again? Watch from the beginning. Yeah. All right, from the beginning. Follow along. I also, I'm going to get the slides up too, just so. Okay. Start from the beginning. If we look at the code from the beginning, we go, okay. X slash 20i, 0x0. This is our vector table. So is this That's this? that. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Ready? It happens to be, we've decided it's it's um, this one. Which is this one. This one. Yep. It's yes. that. So this is it's this 0x18. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to jump here when we get the interrupt. Then we're going to load the PC with whatever is at value 4c and go there. Is that the same as like... Yep, it's that number. And so look, let's look at that number. 0x, 4c. Let's look at that number. That's that number. And it's going to jump there next. Yeah, so this right? is, which so we, is the instruction. Yep, let's think about where we started at. We first started at location 0x, 1x. 0x, 1x. That's where we jump to for the interrupt. Then we're going to jump to... 0x8c4c. Okay. All right. <clears throat> From 0x8c4c, let's go there. Yes, let's see what that's there. 8c4c. Okay. This is our interrupt function that we, that we created, right? Okay. Now we're going to go down here and we're going to go, oh, okay, we're now going to branch to 8a58. Okay. So let's see where that happens. Let's go. 0x8a58. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out where that is. 8a58. Okay. All right. This is now a function called interrupt vector. This is going to look through all of our interrupt vectors and do that. Probably, it may not be on there. Okay. But let's see what it's doing. It's going down What's here. What's the interrupt vector? Okay. Is this is where we say, nope. This is where we say, here's a whole bunch of functions that we want to call whenever an interrupt happens. One of them is our uh, function that we already put in there. One of them might be another one we put in there. Let's say we wanted three things to happen when that interrupt happens. Yeah, and this is like yeah. the vector of like what, yep. like the function that great. Yep. Okay, and so let's actually look at that. So let's go down here. We're going to do this. We're going to do what? We're going to load our five with the this location, and then we're going to branch to 8a88, which is going to... Uh, let's see, 8a88 is down here. We are going to then branch to, okay, we're basically going to branch to 8a74, which is back here. <clears throat> and then we're going to, uh, let's see, we are going to branch to that location in R12. So we're going to load R12. We're basically going to load R12 with one of the values from this table. So let's look at this table, which was at 8a80. X slash X zero X eight A A zero. Ah, nine B zero four. We're going to eventually branch there. So that means we're now going to branch from here to zero X nine B zero four. And what happens at nine B zero four? We're doing a little bit of internal. This yeah, is just a function that's basically doing this. Yeah. Then you say like when you go branch to eight A A zero, which mm -hmm. is Wait, where is it? No, no, we're not branching to 880. We're branching to we're, we're branching to 8a88, which is it's here. Like and this here. is just doing some checking to see if we've got the right, we've yeah, got something so there. And then we're going to branch back to 8a74, which is back up here. How, but how come you're loading like 8? You'll see. Because okay. 8a80 happens up here. It's going to be in R5. Okay. And then we're going to go down here and we're going to load this. Now, this whole instruction down here, this whole instruction here, it's basically saying go into that vector and grab one of those values. So the first one we're going to grab happens to be at 8AA0. If we had more, it would grab the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. Okay. In fact, if we look at this, let, let's say if we look at this, if we look at... Nine B zero four and then garbage, 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 garbage. Yeah. So it's the only we only have one in there. 
That's our function. And if we look at 9b04, 9b04, that, oh, no, I was wrong. <laughs> wrong again, sorry. This is where it lives in the, so we're not actually branching here. This is actually incorrect. We're not actually branching here. This is another address that holds the one we're looking at. Let's, yeah, that, that, I got this wrong in class too. If we look at this, yeah, so you're basically taking a bitmap and turning it into a... 9B04. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that works. That's it. Okay. That is the first one. So but if I we do, if we look at our addresses like here... Yeah, there we go. There's our first one. Then no, no, no. No other handlers. We could put another address to branch to, another address to branch to, after we get done with ours. Mm -hmm. It'll just go and do all the handlers that one after another. So these are like all the handler instructions that you should... This is, these are the addresses of all the functions that we're going to go to. So watch this. If we do list 0x8064, guess what? This is our interrupt handler. And that's where it lives. So it kind of started with like... So we actually branch to what location? We finally branch to this holds location 0x8064, which is where we go to. So we start here. Watch this. We branch here. Then we branch here. Yeah. Then we branch here. And that's four different levels of indirection before so we get there. So you kind of go first into like this table, and then you're like, oh, which yep. interrupt is it? And it's yep. this one. Mm -hmm. And then you go inside here. And you find that address. Yeah. And then you branch there. Also, yeah. You, you so go this there. is the second level. Yep, that's, and then you're like doing the instruction, and then there was, yep. there's like another branch. And this one says, okay, branch to here. And this one says, oh, grab the value here and branch there. And the value that was here is 8064, which is yeah. our program. So everything like below here is happening in the interrupt. Well, well like it's that, like the interrupt ASM calls the interrupt vector one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is like the interrupt vector, which is like the list of instruction that you would do. Yeah. 